Right, we're going to be over in uh, 2 Kings chapter 6. We're going to talk about Elisha, about some of uh, the miracles that he performed over there. And um, miracles are are not um, from man. They're performed by men, but we know that miracles are of God. A miracle is an amazing, wonderful occurrence. It's a marvelous event manifesting a supernatural act of a divine agent. And tonight we all, not all of us, but some of us know that divine agent. Now everybody at some point in time, I believe, are told about that divine agent. You know, and um, those that don't understand, I believe that um, they are... Um, under grace, I believe those um, people, maybe someone who's uh, more has um, a, a mind of a smaller child or somewhat. But um, we are taught about this divine agent, and that divine agent is our Lord God. And in this chapter, that divine agent is going to illustrate to us um, his love and his power and his protection and so forth. And um, it's just going to take just. Um, everyday things in the life of Elisha and he's going to um, use them to demonstrate his love for us now um, book of 2nd Kings here is uh, a period of 308 years it covers and um, the book is it continues to talk about the kingdoms to the captivities um, the translation of Elijah is in this book as well as the ministry of Elisha and we all know there, one of the greatest stories of all, about how Elijah and Elisha and the chariot of fire and so forth. Um, Amos and Hosea prophesied Israel in this, in this book. And Obadiah, Joel, Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Jeremiah prophesied Judah. Um, this book can be translated into seven parts. And it's commonly called the fourth book of Kings. Okay? Um... First and Second Samuel are commonly called the First and Second Book of the Kings, as well as First Kings is called the Third, and Second is called the Fourth. And uh, you'll see that reverenced in your Schofield Bible. Now, there's a difference between Elijah and Elisha. Okay, Elijah's ministry was more public. Elisha's ministry was more private. Elijah brought down fire from heaven. Um, Elisha was more quiet. He um, he shunned the spotlight, but both men were God's prophets at God's time. Um, the things that happened to each man, I believe, happened to that man for a reason. God used the things to happen to Elijah that he would be more strong at, and he used the things that happened to Elisha that he would be stronger at. The title of my message tonight is You Are Not Alone. You Are Not Alone. I'm Not Alone. You Are Not Alone. We are not alone, and um, specifically in this chapter, Elisha and his men were not alone. Now, I told you earlier that um, God's going to illustrate some things for us in, uh, in this chapter. And first of all, we see, by closing our introduction, moving to our outline, we see the illustration of love. Look at 1 Kings chapter 6, verses 1-7. through 7. And the sons of the prophet said to Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there, where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was filling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick, and cast it thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee, and he put it out his hand, and took it. Now we see the illustration of love. Okay, how are they not alone? in this passage. And how does this illustrate love? Well, first of all, we're going to look at the strong relationship between the teacher and the students here 
in the first four verses. Now, the miracle we're about to reveal really demonstrates the character of Elisha. Okay? What's going to happen here really shows you what kind of person Elisha really was. Now, a school. We well, you know there's different parts of the school. Okay, there's different um, there's different positions of a school. Well, one of the main important things of a school, and I'm sure you're going to agree with me on this, is a teacher. Okay, I have written down here the school is only as strong as a teacher. Verse one it says, and the sons of the prophet said to Elisha, Behold, now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Elisha taught at an at a uh, seminary, a theological seminary. Um, that's what I'm in. I'm um, majoring in theology, and I go to Greensboro Bible Institute. That's where I go to school. And uh, this here was the school of the prophets, and the the school was growing, and they needed something bigger. Um, and this tells you here. This shows you what kind of teacher Elisha was. Um, it shows that he was very popular, that the school was starting to grow, that he was a very good teacher. And the teacher's character and ability to teach is a key factor in a school. Um, when I'm in class, if I have a teacher that I just pretty much hold on to every word he says, and I'm so interested in, in not only what he teaches, but also kind of in him. It's like he's kind of like a role model, you know, um, the way he acts, even maybe the way he looks, the way he carries himself, the integrity he may have. Um, it always helps when you have someone to look up to when he's your teacher. Um, I teach little kids Taekwondo, and uh, sometimes I gotta remind myself, hey, you know, I'm the only father figure some of these kids have. Uh, some of those kids may not even have a dad at home, and the only time they actually have a dominant Christian male to look to, maybe, you know, with me. And um, the things I, not only the things I teach them, are important, yes, but the way I act around them, the way I carry myself, the way I talk around them, um, what I let go, and, um, you know, sometimes I may joke around, but then when do I act serious, you know? Um, what do I pick about? What do I stand up for? Um, what do I let by? Do I show favoritism? Stuff like that. And Elisha had a really, uh, a really good character here, I believe. And the school was starting to grow. They were just really enjoying what was going on here. And um, in verse 1, they said, The place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. You know, it was just getting it was getting too small for them. It was starting to get crowded. You know, if you've ever been in a room where things start to grow, uh, you know, people more people start to come. You're like, you know, look, we're just going to have to take this outside or we're just going to have to find somewhere else to go. There's getting to be too many people here. And... Um, Elisha was a strong teacher. He really was. He was a, a, just a real strong teacher. And we see that the students, not only do they care about their teacher, not only was there a strong, not only is the school as strong as a teacher, but the students cared for their careers. Verse 2, Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. These guys really cared about what they were doing. It wasn't just a... Um, kind of idea where they're just going through the motions, you know, um, wake up, go to work, then, oh, yeah, it's time to go to school, you know, sit in school, daydream, whatever, you know, uh, memorize what you got to do, pass your test, and then, you know, got a degree, may use it, may not, whatever, I can use it to fall back on. No, this was their life. These guys, um, every little thing was going to concern them. Um, they loved what they were doing. They not only loved their teacher, not only did they love the Lord, but they loved what they were doing. You know, um, I talked to so many people about, uh, you know, what I do, and they tell me about how it's hard for them to make a decision on what they want to do in school or major and so forth. Well, with me, I've known what I wanted to do ever since I was 12, 13 years old. The Lord called me to be a preacher. And um, not only do I, I love the Lord, and not only do I love the people I preach to, not only do I love the people I teach to as well, but I love to preach and I love to teach. And I believe the Lord's, honestly, I believe the Lord's called me to do both because I have such a desire in my heart to do that. And these guys are willing to do 
really much whatever it took just I mean to make the experience better for them you know um, why be miserable why be all crammed up you know they were they were looking to make improvements they were looking to um, really um, expand what was going on here and they were wanting to go to another building and um, you know some sometimes we kind of complain about certain things well you know uh, this is this place is too small and um, the teacher blah 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 this that no well um, this just goes back to my first point um, the strong relationship between teacher and students Elisha such a good teacher that he continued you know God's the one that puts that desire in someone's heart but I believe personally that a good teacher is what helps that grow through the Lord you know only the Lord can plant that seed and only he can make it grow but he I believe he uses godly teachers and if you do your job as a teacher the way you're supposed to then you'll see the fruits of your labor and that'll be in uh, young men and women through Christ and uh, not only were they growing spiritually but they are growing physically they're you know they're ready to go out there in the woods chop down their own trees and build them a new building you know praise God for that you know how many Christians now would be willing to take time out of you know their busy schedule go out in the woods and build a new church by hand with the axes and saws and so forth you know not many but they were very um, very involved here um, they, they uh, care for their careers and then there was a strong bond between them verse 3 and one said be content I pray thee and go with thy servants and he answered I will go this is just uh, you, you know if you're if you're a teacher if you teach children teach adults whatever it is this is going to mean something to you because um, you know when I first started teaching it was just a job to me in a way um, but once I started teaching the more I started teaching the children I taught start to grow on me and you know when I first came to where I was when I was uh, teaching Taekwondo I'll use that as an uh, example because um, I've always been at this church so you know pretty much whoever I teach here I'm going to be well acquainted with but when I was uh, teaching over at Taekwondo um, when I first got a job there uh, I didn't know a lot of the kids because I had been absent for a long time and then I'd been back for a little bit and then he uh, wanted me to work there full time so I said I'd work there and I'd teach teach for him and I didn't know a lot of the kids that were there they wanted their old teacher you know but the moment the new kids started to come okay those those new kids start to join they start to come well I was their teacher then you know when, when they thought about Taekwondo the older kids they thought about the teacher before me but these new kids that just started when they thought of Taekwondo they thought of Mr. Carmichael and I started to get a relationship with them and not only did I see them grow physically as human beings because a lot of them were just four or five years old when they started but I also start to see them grow in maturity and I start to see them grow in technique they start to get good and they start to get older and wiser and now you know just about every kid there well pretty much all the kids there are are kids that I've just you know taught from the ground up and it's just kind of a blessing to see your hard work pay off like that and Elisha here he had a strong bond between his students he you know, sometimes you see a classroom in, or, or Sunday school, whatever it is. You got the students and then you got the teacher. You know, and you got to remember something. You know, do you want to be a group of individuals or do you want to be a team, pretty much? And a group of individuals, you know, you're not going to accomplish much. But you got to remember as a teacher, you're a part of a team. You know, a uh, man of God, a preacher... He's a part of the church. He's not up here in the mem you know, over here by himself and then the members are no. You're all one body of Christ. Now, <clears throat> don't get me wrong, the preacher is not on the same level as a congregation. Some people may think he is, but I disagree because the Bible tells me that God places a pastor at the head of the church. But sometimes as preachers and teachers, we kind of get this mindset that we're on a completely another universe. You know, we're on a completely different level than these students, and they don't understand us, and we just um, talk in a completely different language. 
and uh, we get up here and say what we gotta say, and then you know um, they take it the way they want it, and then they go on. No, well, there was a bond right here. Okay, they were one. There was a strong bond between Elisha and his boys, and um, they wanted him to go with them. And he didn't say, well, you know, I, I can't associate myself with y'all, or I can't, you know, he went with them. You know, he he didn't let anything get in the way. And, you know, how great of an accomplishment. And not only that, but how much more of a better spirit would you have to know that you're teaching students that you helped build the building you're in. What a strong bond. Have you ever thought about that? What a strong bond. You know, it's like your your life with Christ. Think of it this way, your life with Christ, okay? Lord saves you. You're nothing. Alright, you're just a sinner. But then your body becomes a temple of Christ. And what you are and who you are is because of what Christ had done. So all of us sitting here, our bodies are one in Christ. We're the church, but because of what Christ has done in us. Because of that work, that that new man, that new person he has created, this is the work of Christ. And how much closer we can all be knowing that the church, that us, in, in one body, and you know, in one, one song here tonight, we are what we are because of that person of the Holy Spirit has made us that. And he lives inside us. And that's the bond we share with each other. And there was a strong, strong bond. In verses 4 through 6, there is a small tragedy that happens. And when I say small, um, I'm not talking about small as in um, it, it just doesn't matter or it's just not important. Um, it says, So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And I'll stop right there. Okay, the reason why I said this is a small tragedy is because the Lord takes everything we do into importance. Everything. The Bible even tells us that the hairs of our head is numbered. You know, the um, thing about children, they get upset over little things sometimes. But if you see a child upset, don't undermine it. Don't say, oh, he'll get over it. It's just, a, you know, he just lost one of his toys and he's crying about it. Just, you know, he'll get over it. No. You know, you don't have to show that much compassion, but let him know that you care. You know, little boy, bless his heart, said his chicken died. And he looked sad about it. He looked, you know, he, he lost his chicken. He lost his pet chicken. Now, I could have picked on him about it. Or, um, you know, I could have said something like, oh, yeah, I had him for lunch. And, man, he was good. But I wouldn't say that to him. Because he looked like he was about to cry. That day was really his friend. So I showed him my concern. Like, you know, buddy, I'm, I'm really sorry about it. You know, I took I took time to let him know that uh, I, I felt for him. Maybe I should have done it a little more. Let him know, you know, that I cared about him. Maybe I could have, I didn't. But maybe I should have, you know, put my arm around him. And been like, you know, it's okay, buddy. We all lose some, something here and again. But, you know, nothing is, is small. You know, what may not mean something to you may mean a lot to me. But see, the Lord, He takes interest in everything. Whatever happens, God takes interest in that. The Bible says that casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Every little thing, just little silly things that you think mean absolutely nothing, but they still are bothering you. Well, let me tell you something. The Lord really does care. He really does. If it's just a pet chicken, or if it's the top of an axe here and this young man here he was he was real uh, he was real down about it because not only um iron okay you know now it's nothing to go buy an axe you know any shape size form anything just go to a hardware store go to Lowe's somewhere and get you a, a good old Paul Bunyan axe you'll be fine but back then iron was very I mean just very, very scarce. Just very um, unique. Um, in First Samuel thirteen twenty two, it's talking about how um, two swords for an entire army. You know, um, the rest of them had, all, you know, um, other types of weaponry. But 
only Jonathan and Saul got to carry swords. You know, that's how sacred it was. And um, this axe head was very important to this young man. You know, he, um, you can't just go get, you know, any axe head. He, he had uh, borrowed it from somebody and now it's in the Jordan River. Uh, but we see the, the big deal for him. Then we see the behavior. Well, some teachers might have gave this guy the merit. Okay, but verse 5, it says, But as one, that was a boy, was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. Now this shows that this young man was very careful. Okay, he was very careful. In Deuteronomy, I want to read a verse for you real quick. The scripture even tells us, it, I mean, it, it even um, instructs us what to do if something like this was to happen. And this tells you how important it was back in the day. But Deuteronomy 19, 4 through 5, it says, And, in, and this is the case of the slayer, which shall flee thither that he may live, whoso kills his neighbor ignorantly, whom he hated not in times past. But, as in verse 5, as when a man goes through the wood with his neighbor to hew wood, and his hand fetches a stroke with the axe to cut down a tree, and the head slippeth from the helve, and lieth upon his neighbor, that he die, he shall flee into one of those cities and live. Okay? Um, the Bible, it, it talks about this certain circumstance here. And um, this young man... You know, just in case, you know, if he would have hit somebody, he would have been fine. If he would have killed someone with that axe head, if it would have slipped off and killed somebody, um, he wouldn't have uh, he wouldn't have had to die, as far as the law goes, because um, he was just hewing wood. He was just chopping a tree, and it would have been an accident. Well, this young fella here, he was very careful. Okay, notice that the axe fell in the water. The axe head fell in the water. The way he was standing, he wasn't standing in front of the other guys chopping down trees. Okay, he wasn't. Um, he wasn't standing in front of uh, Elisha, his teacher. He wasn't standing or somewhere where it'd been harmful. He was standing probably just in case that would happen, it would go somewhere into a safe place. We see he was careful, and then we see he was caring. He was caring. He says, "The last master," or it says, "And he cried and said, the last master." For it was borrowed. Sometimes, you know, we let somebody borrow something. That's the last we see of it. You know, you, you let somebody borrow a pair of pliers, and the next thing you know, you don't see it anymore, right? You know, you just, um, you don't know what happened to them. But this this young man here, he, he was real um, concerned because... He was trying to keep a good testimony. You know, small stuff like that means a lot to somebody who really does care. Some people don't care, you know. And if, hey, you ask for your axe head and you get mad, I'll just cuss you out over it because I don't care. But not this young guy. Not him. He cared. He was concerned. And, um, you know, also you guys think... He had to borrow it. Not only does it show me he had a good testimony because he was sad he lost something that was borrowed, but it also shows me that he really wanted to do the Lord's work. That where there's a will, there's a way, the old saying goes. And it showed me that this young man, he had a bond between his teacher. He had a bond with Elijah. And he was willing to do whatever it took go out there and build him a new school and he didn't have an axe what did he do well he went and borrowed an axe he was chopping down went in the water and made him he was he was you know he was sad over that and Isaiah was real concerned he you know he he didn't curse the boy for doing it but in verse 6 it says and the man of God said where fell it yeah, well, hey, Isaiah, I mean, excuse me, Elisha, you know, I thought, I thought he's supposed to be a prophet, you know, I thought he, hey, hey, I thought this guy, he's supposed to tell, you know, he'd be on, you know, he said, you know, where did it go? Now, the Jordan River is very muddy, okay, and um, you couldn't just look in the water and see the axe head, you was like, oh, man, where did it go? 
And um, it, it just shows to me that Isaiah, um, he was real concerned where it went. Sometimes when uh, students come to us, or someone comes to us, um, instead of trying to resolve the problem and find a solution, sometimes teachers or preachers or um, overseas, whatever you want to call them, they just start to ramble. They start to lecture. Right? They just like to hear themselves talk. Instead of, you know, putting yourself on the same level as that student and, and putting yourself you know, in his same situation and how you would want someone to react to you and comfort you and tell you that it's okay and try to help you out and give you, you know, whatever. Sometimes it's just lecture, you know. You know, young man, you shouldn't have been um, hitting the axe that hard or maybe, you know, or maybe he... Maybe his name was, for example, Dean. Maybe his name was Dean. He's just like, oh, Dean, like real frustrated. You know, like, what are you doing, son? Why is it, you know, now it's in the river and we can't get it. No, he didn't, he didn't show frustration. You know, he didn't, uh, he was real concerned. He was just really said, where did it fall? Where fell it? Like, where did it go? You know, and, um, it was kind of a test in a way for this young guy. Because he, he saw exactly where it went. He was paying attention. It's not like he was... You know, looking off somewhere where I didn't know, he saw exactly where he landed, and he said it landed over there. And he wasn't going to lie about it. He couldn't see where it went. He told Elisha exactly what happened. He lied, Elisha, exactly what happened, and um, he showed him. Now, this is where the symbol of God's love comes into play. In the verse six, it says, and he showed him a place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither. And the iron did swim. Now, even the smaller things God can still use. You know, iron and steel ships set sail all you know over the seven seas. We all know that, but that's not a miracle, okay? All right. But when an iron axe head comes up from the bottom of the more of the muddy Jordan River and flows to the surface, then that's a miracle. If you don't think that's a miracle, then you know, something is wrong with you. Now, you know, us in this day and age, we've seen all kinds of things. All right, we've seen, you know, you got movies that got all these special effects, and you got, I mean, technology now is just unreal, and you got all that stuff you see on TV. You see, you see, um, camera tricks, and you see magicians and stuff like that, where you see stuff unreal happening. So it doesn't even really look that unreal anymore. You know, like if I saw, literally. Uh, something like that I wouldn't almost wouldn't even surprise me as much because I'm so used to seeing that stuff in the movies or whatever but you know think about way back in Bible times and even now too but way back then they weren't used to seeing stuff like that and they probably appreciated it more than we would now and to see that to think about that young man just be so down about that and then all of a sudden that axe head just floats right up to the surface doesn't it just floats right up to the surface. And that's a miracle. Now, the axe head is lost in the river, and then it's raised. Okay? Floats up to the river, and then I'm sure he grabs that axe head, cleans it off, he restores it. And then he puts it back on there, and it becomes useful again, doesn't it? Why does that illustrate? That illustrates the symbol of God's love. Man to today is the axe head. We've fallen, slipped away, we're totally depraved. We're, we're lost in the muddy Jordan River, can't see, don't know where we're at, can't see where we're going, we're just lost. But then, that stick, it said, he cut down a stick and cast it thither. So that stick is the cross. Our Lord went to that cross and went down to the waters of death for you and me. 1 Peter 2.24 1 Peter 2.24, I'll read it to you. And it, it, it shows us a verse we can really use that, that um, if I can find it First Peter 2.24 tells us who, it, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed and that's even quoting Isaiah and and he was that that stick represents the cross what he did for you what he did for me how you were just a lost axe head 
in the muddy old Jordan River. And now we can be placed back on the handle of God's plan. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Since God's placed you back on that axe head, since he's, he's, uh, since his son has died on the cross for our sins and he has um, tasted death for every man, now we can be saved. We don't have to worry about all the stuff that we've done. You know, Philippians 3.13 says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. In Christ Jesus. You know, don't don't think about that old Jordan River when you think about your past. When you think about your past, think about that cross and what it's done for you. Think about how God lifted you out of that deep miry clay, or also known as the muddy Jordan River. And he, he lifted you out of that river, and He cleaned you up, and He made use out of you. You know, you think about Paul and Onesimus. You know, Paul, he told old Philemon, he said, just... Whatever Onesimus has done in his past life, put that on my account. You know, if he owes you any debts, whatever it is, put that on my account. Because now, Onesimus is a Christian, and he's going to be profitable. He can be profitable to you, Philemon. God can take your life, something that Onesimus, used, he just ran off. He just, he just ran. He, he didn't take the responsibility, he just ran off. God can take a life like that, he can save you, and he can make your life profitable. We see the symbol of God's love. And then we see the illustration of protection. I'm going to read verses 8 through 17 to uh, finish out here. It says, then, and this is um, kind of while this is going on, kind of like a meanwhile. It says, Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there, not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of the servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel, Tell the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. Now, in verse 8, it says, And the king of Syria warred against Israel. That's just like reading yesterday's newspaper, ain't it? Um, the trouble between um, the Arabs and Israel has a, definitely has a Bible background. And the king of Syria here, he's got a suspicious mind in verses 8 through 11 that we just read because, you know, he's... He's telling these guys what they're going to do, and then they go to do it, and, you know, it's like somebody's done betrayed them, you know. Um, Israel's safe because uh, they know exactly what to do. And it's almost like um, he, his office is, is like he's, he's got a traitor, you know, somebody in the midst of him is a traitor. And, one of them, and, and that's not the case because his guys were real loyal to him. They're very loyal to him. And in um, verse 17, or excuse me, verse 12, he says, um, but Elisha, you know, but Elisha, Elisha's the one. You know, Elisha had the king's bedroom bugged. And those bugs were not microphones. This was before that technology was ever invented. You know what? When I say he was bugged, it's because the Lord was telling Elisha um, what was going on, what to tell the king of Israel. You know, you're not alone. Remember the title of my message? You're not alone. Hey, you know... They weren't alone there, that axe head. They weren't alone there. That, that young man dropped that axe head in the water. He wasn't alone. The Lord took care of it, didn't he? The Lord, the Lord could, took care of his children here. The children weren't alone. God wasn't going to let them sit around like a bunch of ducks and just, you know, what happened, what happened, he'll get them out, whatever happens. No, he, he let them know what to do. He, he got them out of situations. And this really frustrated the king. And he was looking to see, hey, you know, who's this traitor? But... It wasn't a traitor. It's just because we have an almighty, all-knowing God. He's omnipresent. You know, God doesn't need a spy to tell him what the king of Syria is doing. You know, God God knows how many numbers of hairs were on the king of Syria's head. Amen. And um, the king, he has a suspicious mind, but then he had a, uh, 
We see the strong mind of the prophet. And then we see um, the king's strong army in verse 14. And excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. But the king, um, he, the king's sneaky plan. The king's sneaky plan. And he said, go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Okay. He was being sneaky. He was kind of using, he was kind of trying to use the same tactics. And he, you know, as he thought I, uh, Elisha was getting him, he was going to try to use um, the same tactics of how, um, you know, what was going on. He was going to kind of sneak around him. So, um, here's Elisha. He's at Dothan. Okay. And, um, you know, he wakes up, and then we, um, what well, happened in verse 14, Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. Now, I wrote down on paper in, parent, in quotations the king's quote, quote, strong army. Okay, quote. Because in the eyes of man, this is a strong army. You know, you got your chariots, you got your great host, and um, you got your horses, and so on. And that's what you need to really get somebody. Well, we know that ain't true, because the title of my message tonight is, You Are Not Alone. If you got God on your side, that's all you need. It is. It's all you need. The, those chariots, those horses, don't mean nothing. We see... The king of Syria is playing, and then we see God's power. We see the scared servant in verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots, and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? Now, I don't know if this is the same guy that was um, chopping the trees, which I doubt it is because that was one of the students of the school this is more I think of it just a servant somebody helping them out and it hey it, it may have been one of his students we don't know but he kind of said the same words alas my master and this just shows how close Elisha was with God and where God was in his life and it really shows a lot on his character because Elisha reacted the same way to just a small incident with that axe head as he did with a great big army of chariots, men, and horses surrounding the city. He acted the same way because he knew God was in control. And he said, and he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with men. The Bible says over in Hebrews 13, verse number 2. I'll read it. You don't have to turn there. In Hebrews 13, verse number 2. says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. There's angels all around us. Okay, um, You're not alone tonight. The Lord, He's going to take care of you. And um, He says, They that be with us are more than they that be with them. If it's just a small axe head, or if it's a whole army surrounding you, God is going to take care of you. Whatever your incident is, if it's just something small, something kind of like... You know, kind of like an eyelash in your eye and it's bugging you. It doesn't sound like much, but it's really bugging you. Or something like a broken leg or a bad back. Whatever it is, the Lord is there with you and He's going to take care of it the way He sees fit. And in verse 17, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Amen. I mean, amen, just, um, I have written down here, your God is greater than your problems. You know, sometimes we look at the situation instead of looking at God, don't we? For example, the new year, we know that two, uh, 2010 is going to have some problems for us. We know that. There's going to be some obstacles for us, but it's in God's hands, okay? Maybe tonight you need to pray that going into a new year, the prayer that Elisha prayed here and not only for your people around you but for yourself say and say Lord I pray thee open his eyes pray tonight Lord open my eyes 
Remind me of your power. Remind me of how you're the one that that allows things to happen. Remind me that you're the one that saved me. You're the one that's coming back for me. You're the one that's already declared me victorious. You're the one that's made me conquerors through your son, through his blessed name. You're the one that can help me tonight. You're the one that's going to help me through this year. We need to really just give it all to God. And, and Elisha said, Lord, just open this young man's eyes. He's scared. He's nervous. And what, man, what, what, what a great uh, prophet. What a great man Elisha was. Just It really shows me why his students want to build a new school because he just has such a strong bond. Just I mean, something that I, I, I would really like to have with, with people that I teach. Just such a strong bond. Just such a, um, whatever it was, the Lord had, had, had given that man faith to help him out. And um, we see that um, the surrounding power of God. You know, don't just have confidence in what you see. You know, have confidence in what you can see. Have faith in God tonight. You know, not only is this an illustration of protection, but this is also an illustration of power, isn't it? No, you're not alone. Nothing's going to happen to you unless God allows it to happen. By way of conclusion, in um, verses 18 through 23, and read this on your own time now, but this is the conclusion of the story, of this part of the story. And we all know that um, uh, Elisha in verse 18 prayed that these people those men that were surrounding them be smoked with blindness and um and Elisha led them to Samaria and then the Lord opened their eyes and then um in verse 22 instead of smiting them he set bread and water before them didn't he that they may eat and drink and go to their master and verse 23 says and he prepared great provision for them and when they had eaten and drunk he sent them away and they went to their master so the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. Think about Elisha for a second. Think if this man didn't have the mindset and if his heart wasn't where it was with the Lord. Think about some of the things that would have happened. And for example, he probably would have yelled at that young man for his axe head going in the water. He probably would have got frustrated at him. He probably... Uh, or maybe he just would have acted like it was no big deal and wasn't allowed that man to work anymore gave him a demerit and then when it come out time for those people to surround him he probably would have painted along with his servant and he probably would have been uh, a bad example in front of his servant remember you know especially your students or whoever it is people some somebody somewhere looks up to every person I'm preaching to tonight somebody somewhere and if it's not now, it's, it's been before in your life, or you're going to meet somebody. There is at least one person, I believe, that's going to kind of look up to somebody. If it's a small child or whoever it is, they're going to look up to you, and they're going to watch you in times of distress, and they're going to watch you in times of chaos, in times when you need to handle yourself. And Elijah really handled himself, didn't he? And then he probably just would have went ahead and if God gave him that power to smite them blind and so forth and then lead them to Samaria and when their eyes were open he kind of just smote them couldn't he but he didn't Elisha he he did what was right in the eyes of God and tonight Elisha that young man swinging the axe they weren't alone were they that servant and Elisha when when those men surrounded him they weren't alone either were they well tonight we're we're get we're closing a decade here, and I want you to think about all the things that, that have happened in ten years, especially at this church. You know, you've been in this church for ten years, like I have. You know, you've seen a lot, and it's, it's it's really it's an honor and a privilege to be able to preach the last message here at this church for for this decade from 2000 to 2009, and we've seen a lot happen in ten years. And I want you to look back at instances from 2000. To 2009, okay. Look deep in your heart, and I want you to think about times where you were in trouble, or you were distressed, and just look back at that time. That whole time, you were not alone, were you? God got you through it, didn't He? And hey, there's some things that happen we don't understand, but everything happens 
to God's will and God's plan. Everything. I may not be able to explain some things. You may not be able to explain some things. But everything happens for a reason and for a purpose. Tonight I challenge you with all my heart. I challenge you. Don't go into 2010 unprepared. Know that when, as soon as you take that ne next step, it may be your last step. It may be the, it may be one of many. But take that step knowing that you are not alone. Give it all over to God. Say, Lord, I want to serve you. I want to trust you. Pray that prayer Elisha prayed. Say, Lord, just open his eyes. Pray and I say, Lord, just open my eyes. Just, just give me the faith I need. Pray for, the, pray for the Lord to give you the faith you need. Dear Lord, with all my heart, dear God, I pray you'll just use this message, Lord. It's not about the time of it. It's not about how many amens I get, dear Lord. But it's how it impacts hearts, dear Lord. And the people can be changed, dear God. And just help them, Lord. Not only help them, Lord, but Lord, help me with this message, Lord. Open my eyes, Lord. Give me the faith that I need to make it through um, 2010. And, and maybe... Lord, Lord willing, many more years, dear God. You'll just be with me, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.